think that I, I very much came to filmmaking out of a basic curiosity about what makes us human. And I think that's important. I think it's important to come to cure, filmmaking not from a sense of stories you want to tell, a sense of knowing something already, but actually out of curiosity, a curiosity about what, what we are, what we come from, what, what is consciousness, what influences how we perceive, how we relate to each other. I didn't uh, intend to study filmmaking. I, went, I began my, uh, I went to college, university, to study theoretical physics and cosmology because I was interested in what existence is, why there is something rather than nothing. And yet it was a boring time in uh, physics, at least to me. There was not yet the particle accelerator creating, uh, exploring the very nature of, of matter, and there was the, the results weren't yet coming in from the Hubble Space Telescope. telescope. String theory was not yet uh, sort of being analog considered and, and explored. And so it, we were all being pushed into engineering and applied physics, and that was absolutely not what I wanted to do. So I, I left physics and started exploring philosophy and what we are, the questions of uh, why we exist, uh, what, what is consciousness, metaphysical questions, and I realized that um, philosophy was attempting to uh, frame these questions in logical forms, but I felt that the real answers to these things might be in experience itself, might be in practice, and uh, ways of perceive, finding new ways of exploring and perceiving the world. And I was, I, I don't know exactly what happened, but I was on a glacier one day um, in, I was, I'd, I'd, I'd had a, uh, in the middle of university, I'd taken a year out to work on a street theater project. I got a grant to work on a street theater project in Calcutta. And I'd taken, I'd gone traveling up into the, into Pakistan and then was on a glacier and it was pitch black. You would think a glacier is white. And I climbed and climbed and climbed to reach this glacier. It was covered with dust and debris. And there I was sitting on it. And for some reason, I don't remember what was so upsetting to me that day, but I started to cry. I was crying about something. And on my way down from that emotional moment, I somehow knew I would return at university and change everything I was doing and become a filmmaker. I had no long-standing love of cinema. My memories of film as a child were traumatic or confused. I was the youngest, I, and so we would always go to see films that were too uh, complicated for me to understand or too violent. I was therefore afraid most of the time, and, or weeping, or hiding behind this chair in the cinema. But somehow I knew I would be a filmmaker, and for me filmmaking is my way of, it's a kind of life, life journey through which I can, am free to explore those aspects of the world which are most mysterious to me, most painful to me, most important to me. Exploring the most painful things, we overcome somehow our fear of looking. Uh, it's like over, a child overcomes their fear of, his or her fear of the dark, and we become stronger and more adventurous still. And then, Having explored these aspects of humanity that most intrigue and puzzle and, 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 and puzzle me, I see the work of the film of, of editing and putting together a film not as not as uh, storytelling, but as translating into a kind of poetic, visceral experience all of the wisdom and mystery that is encountered through the process of shooting and the first part of editing. So I see I see myself much more as an explorer than as a storyteller. Well, one thing I would say about the kind of work that I make that maybe is particularly useful for nonfiction filmmakers to hear, or aspiring nonfiction filmmakers, you see, I feel like there's a, a kind of false, uh, a false dichotomy in how we understand nonfiction, that either things are staged or you're observing a pre-existing reality. You're documenting a pre-existing reality. And I think very often when we pretend to be, when films pretend to be, documenting a pre-existing reality, what they're really doing is working together with the filmmakers, working with her subjects or his subjects to simulate a reality in which they pretend the camera is not present. And uh, when things are staged, we criticize it because there's, a, there's an attempt to hide that fact, and yet somehow we feel there's a lack of authenticity. And I think nonfiction filmmakers could understand, would, would maybe benefit from Two things that I feel I've, I've discovered over the many years of making The Act of Killing and The Look of Silence. Namely, first of all, that the moment that whenever you film anybody, they will automatically start to stage themselves. 
And that moment of self-consciousness is not necessarily a liability. It's not necessarily something we should strive to get past as quickly as possible in order to get authenticity. Actually, the effort to stage themselves, the motives why a person feels the need to stage themselves, uh, is authentic. It's insecurity. It's doubt. It's the, it's the gap between how one wants to see oneself and how in one's most dark moments one really sees oneself. And that's the very stuff of what we are. So if instead of seeing that uh, moment of self-staging as something to get past, and instead seeing it as an opportunity, if we see it as an opportunity, the non-fiction film camera becomes precisely a prism which makes visible the stories, the fantasies, the narratives, uh, often second-hand, third-rate, borrowed uh, from mainstream media, from social media, by which we know ourselves and know our world. I was recently at a concert, a big concert of Latin music, and everybody there was, instead of watching the concert, they were taking the whole time taking pictures of themselves watching the concert, and not just that, editing the pictures, Photoshop, uh, uh, touching up the pictures, and sh editing their video and sh sharing it. So we, n in this, this issue of self-consciousness, I think, is increasingly impossible to avoid, and we may as well embrace it and use it as a way of a crack through which we can gain insight into the role of the imagination in making us what we are and, may, and in constituting our understanding of existence. Cool. The second understanding, I think, of my work as a nonfiction filmmaker uh, that I think allows us to transcend or move beyond this dichotomy between uh, sort of so-called so direct cinema, direct documentation of a pre-existing reality on the one hand, and the, the accusation that something's staged or inauthentic on the other, is actually an understanding of what we do as nonfiction filmmakers that is in fact common to all filmmakers, including fiction filmmakers. I think within the overall safe space of making a film, we take journeys with people and we create through our intimacy with the people we're working, we create occasions in which, which, which become kind of like, which become sort of portals through which uh, fundamentally insightful contradictions can be revealed. So within the overall safe space of making a film, these occasions become moments where everybody, ideally, not just participant, but also filmmaker, is pushed way beyond their comfort zone into a space where the most painful, vexing, and difficult issues that the film is exploring are becoming visible in authentic ways. And if we understand any documentary, including the masterpieces of direct cinema, as being that, then, we, then aspiring filmmakers can understand what uh, documentarians and nonfiction filmmakers are doing when their work is actually successful. So we need to know ourselves, first of all. And an artist, every, anyone whose work is about trying to take a journey to the most important and painful and mysterious questions that we face as a species, had better make everything about that journey as comfortable as possible emotionally, and because what you're going to find there is not going to be comfortable. That's certain from, advance, in adva from the beginning. So it is important that we not start the journey accusing ourselves that we must work more quickly or we must uh, work more carefully. We have to, I think it is all of our task. We all owe this to the world, to each other, to ourselves, and certainly to the people with whom we film. We must, we Oh, we, ha we have an obligation to ask the most important questions and not to, uh, not to shirk from our duty to give those the utm utmost seriousness. So for me, I, I start a project with a set of questions, a theme. Uh, in the case of both my films, it's, the theme is impunity. In the act of killing, it's the boasting and the stories that the perpetrators are telling themselves to justify what they've done. In the look of silence, it's what does it do to human beings to have to live for 50 years in silence? Um, and, and in both films, in the, the look of silence and particularly the uncut version of the act of killing, I do not stop the shooting or the editing until... I feel I've gone as deeply as I possibly can. And I, on, I only stop shooting when the, my theme, with working with the theme, the questions, a method that's devised to specifically to answer those questions and a set of characters. So 
I do not stop until I'm no longer getting deeper and I start moving sideways or just asking new sets of questions. That's when it's time to start editing. And then the editing is not a storytelling process where I want to show the viewer what happened in the shoot. The editing is, a, is about, for the most part, excavating the layers of meaning that I've uncovered through the shooting process, or that are, sorry, that are excavating the layers of meaning in the footage that I've shot. Um, I try to make my footage as multi-layered as possible, as dense as possible. And uh, then only in the last third of the editing, perhaps, am I something like a storyteller. And even there, I see myself as creating immersive experiences rather than recounting stories. You see, the distinction might seem semantic, but it's really one of distance. Uh, a storyteller, you listen to a story. You are immersed, I hope, in my films and and there's a slight difference there and i think but i think it's a very important one when we remember that sound is a tactile medium and and cinema should be a tactile medium I think it was important in my journey to making, that brought me to the starting point of, sh of shooting The Act of Killing and The Look of Silence. It was important to me over at that point, five years or so, to make a series of more manageable works where I discovered the questions I was interested in, in the form, the language. The, it was also an exploration and those works are sort of wildly experimental. I made a series of very short films, a half an hour film, a 50 minute film. Um, and those, I don't think I could have just started off from zero and made The Act of Killing. And before I could even make The Act of Killing, I worked for uh, half a year with Christine Sin and others to, to help plantation workers make the globalization tapes, when I, whereupon I learned uh, Indonesian. Then there was about two years from that time when we finished until I started making The Act of Killing, where I was first working with the survivors and then every perpetrator I could find. Some of that early material with the perpetrators is in the look of silence. So I think the, the lesson here is that you, you, need to, you need to have laboratory spaces, I believe. And um, what that laboratory space looks like will change over the course of your development. For me, it was shorter films, but I always, at the, at the beginning, but the, the longer of the shorter films, I always felt as kind of, um, I always felt as kind of monumental works at the beginning. In hindsight, they're not. So I think I've always had that sense of ambition that whatever I'm doing is as important as it could possibly be, even though in hindsight they're shorts. And so, and I think there's time, but I think there's also times for the laboratory where you're just jumping in and making experiments and times where you shouldn't do that, or at least I can't do that. And people shouldn't feel pressured to do that. Uh, the times for that, I think, are when you're defining a project, when you're looking for the questions you want to ask, when, you're, uh, when you have an, an, an argument or a, something that upsets you, but you, are not yet, you don't yet know the characters with whom you will take the journey that will lead to that really deep exploration. And I would, I would allow yourself those times to make things quickly. And I don't think, I, I think this has, I want to emphasize, this has nothing to do with the career building work of sending those out as calling cards and establishing yourself. I don't think that any of the early work I did was important to gaining the support that I ultimately gained in, in terms of making, to make the look of silence and the act of killing. I think that that laboratory is for you creatively. It's not a kind of, it's not part of a business plan. It's not a career development. It's about, it's an artistic development. And once I really get sucked into a project, it's very hard for me to focus on, to sort of focus on multiple projects. And people assume, oh, your film, these two films took a decade, but you must have been doing many other things. There were things I had to do in order as sort of requirements for the funding, like we edited a book as part of an arts and humanities research grant in the United Kingdom at the very earliest stage as I finished a PhD. But those, but really what I was doing, everything emotionally, artistically, once I started in 2003, 2004, 2005, everything was then focused on making these two films. And I had no qualms, although I had to convince myself not to, but I had no qualms about uh, not churning things out.